All right, hi everyone, I'm Jenna, and today I'm going to be talking about Phaser. All right, so what is Phaser? Uh, it's an open source, uh, so free, HTML5 game framework. Uh, it uses a custom build of Pixie.js, which is just like a super fast 2D JavaScript rendering library. Uh, it's great for desktop and mobile browsers, and pretty much deals with um, like browser and device compatibility issues for you. Uh, it was created by Richard Davey, who is the lead dev of Photon Storm. Uh, all right, so let's make a game. Uh, so this is a very basic game setup for a phaser game. The first thing we're doing is creating a new game instance and assigning it to a local variable game. Uh, Phaser.game is what creates your entire game object. The first two parameters we pass in are going to be the width and the height of your game. So like the screen dimensions, here I set it to 800 by 600 pixels. Your actual game world, though, can be any size you like, but this is just the size that's going to be displayed. Uh, the third parameter is how the game is going to render in the browser. If you set it to phaser.auto, phaser works some magic and takes care of some browser rendering choices for us. Um, that's part of the Pixie.js that I had just mentioned. Um, so the first line gives us an empty game. Now we want to give the game a state, uh, give it some functionality. So the game state is just a JavaScript object with a few essential default methods that belong to it. Uh, the first method, preload, is always called first. It loads all of our game's assets, usually things like images, sprite sheets, web fonts, stuff like that. Uh, we need to make sure that we preload our image files because it can take a little bit of time and like on a website, if an image isn't loaded yet, you might see a white rectangle. Uh, that's definitely not what you want when you load like Mario. You don't want a white rectangle where he should be. Um, so create is called after preload. When the create method is called, uh, we already have all the images loaded in memory so we can access them quickly. Uh, the update method is going to be called multiple times per second for as long as your game is running. So it does things like checks to see any like, user input, uh, pressing arrow keys, clicking a mouse. It checks for collisions between game elements, stuff like that. And lastly, we want to call game.state.add uh, with a game state. This adds a state to our game, and then game.state.start and pass in what state we want. Um, so this is all great, but we're only dealing with a single state. Uh, whatever we choose to do with this game, it's probably um, like isn't going to be very interesting, or the code's going to get very messy very quickly. But luckily, we're all very familiar with ES6 classes and modules, uh, which makes state management on Phaser super easy. Uh, and we definitely want to use a state management in our game. It flushes memory, uh, removes listeners, and manages garbage collection for us. Uh, so yeah, this slide we're basically doing the same thing as the last. Uh, we're creating a new instance of a game with phaser.game, except now we're using classes. Um, and then we're initializing it with new game at the bottom. Uh, and in the super, we're passing in the game's dimensions and preferred renderer. Should all look pretty familiar. Uh, but yeah, now we're going to be using multi multiple states. So you can see at the top, we're importing three different states that I've created in separate files. Uh, and then in the constructor, I'm adding them all to the game object with uh, game.state.add. Um, oh, and then using game.state.start and passing in the boot state, which is the first state we want our game to run through. So let's look at the boot state. Um, all right. Uh, OK, boot state. Uh, as we all know, you want to make sure to export this class so we can import it in our main.js. Um, from the previous slide, but this one's pretty boring. Um, it mostly does a bunch of preloading stuff and makes sure our Google fonts are loaded uh, before we can call our next state. Uh, we're also loading like a loading bar image, so if there's any lag in between when we start the game, um, there'll be a nice little loading bar sprite that we see. Um, loading an image is pretty easy. It's just game dot load dot image and you pass in the key you want to set it as and then the file path to the image. All right, and we'll add that to our actual game in the next state, which we're initializing at the bottom with game.state.start. And so 
Uh, the splash state basically just adds those bars that'll make it look like the game's loading. Uh, wherever you see this dot add dot something, uh, you're going to actually be adding that to the game's canvas or the screen. And right now, um, like this is just re referencing the game object. All right, so splash state is also preloading our background, which is going to look like this. It's a nice little grassy stage. Um, and then we're also loading a sprite sheet uh, that I made for our main character, which is this cute little knight. Um, a sprite sheet, if you don't know, is just an image file that contains a bunch of smaller graphics in like a tiled arrangement. It's useful for animations because you can compile several states for our character into a single, single file. Um, and now from the splash state, uh, inside the create method, um, we initialize our next state, which is uh, the game state, uh, where we do a bunch of fun stuff. So now that we've loaded everything from other files, we can actually add it to our game's canvas. Uh, so first, I'm adding the background image that we loaded in the previous state. Then I'm going to add some text to our game uh, with that Google font that we preloaded in our first state and using this.add.text, and then passing it in some fancy x and y parameters um, for where the text should show up in the game. Uh, after that, phasers methods are pretty self-explanatory for the text part. Um, it's also important to note that you should be adding elements linearly. Uh, so if I had added the text before the background, the text would stay behind the background and we'd never see it. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, then I'm adding the sprite sheet that we've already got loaded. So this.add.sprite, passing in where we want the knight to show up on the screen, and then the key we named it when we loaded it in the previous state. Um, then I'm just scaling down the sprite because it's pretty big. Uh, and then I'm adding animations. So here I'm creating the animations walk, jump, and idle. The second parameter for those, I'm just specifying which frames from the sprite sheet uh, I want to be correlated with each animation. And then the third parameter there is just a Boolean. So if I want the animation to loop, set it to true. OK, so now we have all the elements for our game. The update function is going to be called several times per second, uh, always watching for whatever we tell it to watch for. In this case, um, it's just watching for some simple arrow key actions. Uh, if any of those actions are triggered, the corresponding animation will play um, 15 frames per second on a loop. Uh, and then I've also made our background scroll along the x-axis uh, whenever we're holding down the right arrow key. So let's see what that looks like. So you can see he's, he's walking when I hold down the right arrow key, and the background is scrolling when I do that too. Um, and he also jumps, but he's not really, he's not really going anywhere. Uh, in order to make him move around the screen, we need to add Phaser's built-in physics system. Uh, so Phaser makes it really easy to implement uh, this functionality with gravity and velocity um, and tons of other methods that are already built in. So we're going to implement some of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, Phaser has a couple different built-in physics systems. Arcade is the one I'm using. Um, it's the most basic and definitely the easiest one to use. So back in the create method in game.js, um, we're introducing Phaser's arcade physics system and enabling those built-in methods and rules onto our main knight character. And we're making sure the character has a little bounce whenever he hits the ground. And with the dot gravity method, we're making sure that he actually at some point hits the ground. Um, and then with um, collide world bounds, we're just making sure he's confined to the game world so he doesn't run off the screen. Um, so yeah, we've kept everything the same in the update function, just added uh, the night dot body dot velocity, which is going to um, be the knight's rate of change in speed, so measured in pixels per second. And we make sure that the left and right arrows change the character's velocity along the x-axis, and then the up arrow changes it along the y-axis. So with just a couple lines of code, 
we'll see that he is now moving. And he jumps pretty high, and he kind of moonwalks backwards because <laughs> I was lazy and didn't want to change the sprite. But it's kind of cuter that way. <laughs> oh no, he didn't go. There he is. <laughs> I was like, why aren't they looking at him moonwalking? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and that's it. Um, that's the rundown on Phaser using ES6. Uh, it's a pretty popular framework right now, and it's very actively maintained and has a large open source community. So uh, I encourage any of you that are interested in making a game for Stackathon or Capstone to look into Phaser. It feels uh, surprisingly familiar with what we've learned so far, and it's a great gateway into game development. And also add a link to my Git repo of this game in like the comments section on YouTube, because I added stuff like enemies and stuff. <laughs> cool, and yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs>